We will be reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 62, verses 1 through 5, which you will find uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, at page uh, 692. For Zion's sake, I will not keep quiet. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name given to you by the mouth of the Lord. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For just as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder, your God, be married to you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you this morning. Uh, Ray is a dear, dear friend. Uh, We went through seminary together and then went through our Uh, clinical pastoral education IU Methodist uh, together this fall. Uh, I'd like us to bow our heads for one moment before we hear and speak of God's word. Gracious and merciful God, may your light shine upon us. May we hear your words, write them upon our hearts, and speak them from our lips. I'd like to talk about prophets this morning. So I'd like you to take a moment and kind of imagine, if you will, what it was like to be the Israelites at this time. You are living in forced exile, having been taken into custody by the Babylonians, who have conquered the kingdom of Judah, once led by the great and mighty King David, a kingdom once loyal to the one true God. While in exile, You tell your children about the bounty of the fields of your homeland, about the beauty of the landscape, the majesty of the temple built by Solomon, and the imposing walls that defined and defended Jerusalem at that time. You reminisce about those holy days and those festivals that brought thousands of Israelites from far and near into the city of Jerusalem for long and engaging and energetic celebrations of life and God. You yearn to go home, but that seems impossible now. But then the impossible happens. You see, about 70 years into their exile, the king of Persia, Cyrus, conquered the Babylonians And not only that, the king Cyrus granted the Israelites their wish to return to Jerusalem. And not only that, he gave you laborers and he gave you some supplies to help rebuild your city. You have a long trip home, but you're energized during this trip by these idyllic visions that you remember of Jerusalem. Problem is, when you arrive, the walls are still crumbled. There is no temple. Those bountiful fields have been plundered, and the landscape is ravaged by war. But you're still hopeful, you're back home, And you, the Israelites, start the building process. And decade after decade after decade, you try to rebuild the Jerusalem you remember. But somehow, despite all your hard work, 
and all of your efforts, the temple is still not completely built. The city walls are still broken. And the signs of life in those fields and landscapes, well, maybe, maybe, they are beginning to show again. And you say, why has God abandoned us? Why has God rejected us? I want you to understand that in our reading today, those are the people that Isaiah is speaking to. Those are the people for whom he is calling the weary, the downtrodden, the burden-laden people of God. And I want to talk a little bit about prophets, because I think they're important for us to know about. But prophets speak to us not when things are good and hunky-dory. Prophets speak to us when we are in the midst of the gravest of crises, when our luck has run out and depression and hopelessness has set in and our God seems so very, very far away. But in that time, in that grave crisis, Isaiah tells his people, I will not keep silent. I will not rest until Jerusalem's vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. You see, the secret here is that prophets are pesky and persistent preachers of God's words. Jesus reminded us, though, in that role, prophets are often not welcome in their own homeland. And that's because prophets speak the truth, an uncomfortable truth, a stark and often utterly unwelcome truth, the truth of the harsh realities of our life and times. You see, many years before this, before the Israelites were exiled, you see, the same Isaiah urged the Israelites and their king to stop their evil ways and to hold steadfast to the ways of the Lord. And what happened? The Israelites did not heed Isaiah's warning, and so they ended up in a foreign land under foreign rulers. And as I thought about this, I thought, how strange it is for Isaiah to now be saying, Jerusalem will be restored and vindicated. Because I must confess, and I've probably done this, and I know I've done this, that my temptation would be to say, I told you so. You didn't listen to me. Don't come for help now from me. But that is the difference between me and a prophet. That is not the prophetic inclination. The prophet is God's vessel, and God is always faithful to God's people, at all times and in all places. Wherever we are, we will find God. Jesus confirmed and told us, wherever two or more of us are gathered, there I will be. And I will assure you that Doris and I did not talk before I'm about to give this sermon. But like Doris, I feel sort of like the returned people of Israel. You see, 50 years ago, in 1964, we passed civil rights legislation. That legislation forbid discrimination because of race or sex or age or religion. We passed civil rights legislation that forbade discrimination in housing and employment. I looked up some of this and had forgotten some of the words the President of the United States spoke before a joint and combined Congress. And I quote, Johnson stated, it is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny the right to vote to any of our fellow Americans. Johnson continued, there is no struggle for states' rights or federal rights. There are only human rights. This language begins to sound a little familiar, but not for the reasons that John, we would like it to be. At one point, Johnson urged, we must close the springs of racial poison. We must come to have understanding in our hearts. And I will tell you that as a young 10, 12, 13-year-old, I ate up those words. 
In those days, lawyers didn't become law people didn't become lawyers to earn money. People became lawyers to fight for the cause of justice. But 50 years from then, now, you will not, you will not hear those words from our leaders. You will hear, rather, governors who reject the refugee, who seeks only a safe place because their country is being bombed literally by every Western nation. You will hear presidential candidates demand that we close our borders to people of Muslim faith. And we have city officials throughout this country who simply refuse to grapple with the reality of police violence. Even this week, the Anglican World Communion, in fact, silenced the United States Episcopal Church because they had the audacity to allow people of the LGB community to be ordained, and they permitted, if a congregation wanted to, the marriage of same-sex couples. We know that the poison of prejudice is served up at political rallies and spread out by a media competing for ratings and for profits. I am weary, and I am, as I suspect many of you are, at a loss as to what to do. It seems that we are afraid to speak the truth that violence lies in our hearts, not in the hearts of others, that the springs of racism poison our beings, that the wells of hate run deep as we point time and again to the other as the cause of our discomfort and our disquiet. The question we must ask ourselves, or I ask us to ask ourselves, is can we afford to remain silent? And if not, whose voice will rise up in the wilderness? Now, President Johnson by no way is a prophet, and in fact, some days his, his record is so mixed because of what happened next in Vietnam. But I will tell you, at that time in 1964, like the King Cyrus of ancient times, Johnson took this step because he was impacted by the calls of an oppressed people, the calls to be restored to a place of human dignity, the calls to break down the systems and the structures and the laws of this country that kept African Americans enslaved. I went back and I saw the video because after Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he handed one of his signature pens to one of the truest prophets of modern times, Martin Luther King, Jr. You see, like Isaiah of long ago, Dr. King also warned us of the consequences of what he called the triple evils, racism, militarization, and economic exploitation. Dr. King urged us to wage an all-out war on poverty, to eradicate racism, and to embrace nonviolence, not just as political action, but as a way of being with our Lord. Dr. King warned us, but too many of us have succumbed to the temptations of wealth, the virility of violence, and the belief that somehow simply by the circumstance of our birth as male or female or white or whatever religion, we think we are better than God's other children. What Dr. King, though, also called for was the building of God's beloved community right here, right now, in this world, in this place. A beloved community God's crown jewel for all to see. A beloved community where human decency reigned. A beloved community 
where love and justice triumphs over fear and hatred, a beloved community where peace and justice prevails over war and violence. So you see, the true prophet not only warns us, the true prophet always gives us strength and hope and energy and confidence that our God is with us, our God is in us, and our God is leading the way towards that beloved community. What I'd like to turn to now, primarily in closing, are the words from a compilation of Martin Luther King's prayers that I received from Mart in taking a class about Martin Luther King from one of the great uh, scholars, uh, Rufus Burroughs. And no matter how many times I go through this book, it is this prayer that Martin Luther King gave in 1995 to his church, the Montgomery Dexter Baptist Church, so long ago. He prays to God, help us never to let anyone or any condition pull us so low as to cause us to hate. Give us the strength to love our enemies and to do good to those who despitefully use us and persecute us. We thank thee for thy church founded upon thy word that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but to go out and work as though our very answers to our prayers depended upon us and not thee. Finally, help us to realize that humankind was created to shine like the stars and to live on through eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all of God's children, black, white, red, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity in the kingdom of our Lord and of our God. And he says, we pray, amen. I have no way to beat or compete with those words. I simply ask you that we move beyond our weariness until God's beloved community shines for all the world to see. Remember, God delights in you, God delights in me, and we together can do this. Amen.